You are listening to War of the Stars, a Star Wars podcast presented by Realm of the Mist Entertainment with your host, John Tolley. And welcome to War of the Stars, a Star Wars podcast. We're coming to you tonight, as always, from deep within the Outer Rim, far beyond the watchful eyes of the Galactic Empire. My name is John Mark Tolley, and joining me today, as always, is my co-pilot, my co-host, Mr. Ray Rumsey. Hey, what's Ray, up, how everybody? Are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Mark? Oh, a little tired, a little sore, but, you know, that's life. Um, <laughs> that is yeah. life in the outer rim <laughs> yes it is it is always on the run from the empire you never know uh so um not a lot of star wars news right now so we won't spend a lot of time on what's going on in the world of star wars so um we're just going to go right into the main event if you will and finish up our talk on the Clone Wars and um, kind of go over the the causes of the Clone Wars and kind of what led to them and obviously it was the you know string pulling by Palpatine but there was a lot more that went into it than just that and um, you know you go you can you go all the way back to Episode One and and the um, the Phantom Menace where you see that the Republic wasn't as united and as strong and as um, as as you know in universe as they probably would want people to think. Right. And yeah. you see that with you know the you know the tariffs being levied and the whole incident with Naboo and everything like that, that, you know, things weren't all peachy keen, if you will, within the, re within the, uh, the Republic. Right. Yeah. They, they pretty much let the separatists, so to speak, um, get away with whatever they wanted when they wanted to set up the blockade. Now I know that was Palpatine again, doing his puppet point, yeah. but still, you can look at how those uh, meetings went in the Senate and you could pretty much see there was a division between all of the different planets. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you go, you can also look, I mean, how strong was that the Republic as far as being a united government? I mean, it almost seems to me like it would be more closer related to what we see now with the United Nations where each planet was independent mm -hmm. and the Republic was just sort of a you know didn't really have any teeth right there wasn't yeah. really a lot they could do you know they didn't have a military you know they had the Jedi but the, you know, the Jedi could only do so much and, right you know as far as defense you know each planet was you know, basically responsible for its own def planetary defense. You know, there wasn't a, you know, galactic navy or a republic army or anything like that, at least at, you know, at the beginning of before the Clone Wars. You know, it was very much a pacifistic organization as far as, you know, like that, that, that part went. So, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. You, um, I mean, they they pretty much. It seemed like it was meant to be a time where, yeah, they had the the bandits roaming around and smugglers doing their thing and bounty hunters, but it seemed like the the majority of the planets were more interested in, uh, you know, trade and uh, industry and whatnot. Yeah. And the, yeah. They they didn't have well at least in my opinion or maybe it was because they just didn't show it very much so it was kind of speculative, but they didn't really have what we would consider like a standing military. 
I mean, no. you look at Naboo, they they hardly had anybody. It was very easy for them to get rounded yeah. up. Yeah, they basically just had a a, you know, a a militia, a small militia, to right. help defend the planet. But you know, that also goes. And one thing I thought was really interesting is you have this large governmental body in the Republic that allows companies basically to act as basically independent nations. Right. It would be you know, it would be like if you know suddenly Walmart decided we're going to be our own country. We have enough <laughs> we have enough power, we have enough man, you know, enough people in, we we make enough money. Yeah, sure. We're going to have our own country and you know it was kind of the same thing with you know the um oh what were the the there was the banking clan um I can't think who else. Who were the, I can't think of the name of the group that actually started the blockade. Oh, you're you're gonna you're gonna oh. put me on the spot, aren't you? I am, <laughs> I am, because otherwise I'm just gonna be. I know people out there yelling, yelling at us, like telling us right now, probably, and saying us to turn on, turn in our Star Wars cards, right? <laughs> like you don't know that. <laughs> I, but, you know, I didn't uh, really. I just kind of always considered them the separatists. I never really paid a whole lot of attention to well, what they were called. Well, I mean, the separatists were, it wasn't just those groups. There were full planets that, because, and this goes in, you know, we, we're going to, we'll talk about this too, is the reasoning behind them leaving, you know, why they decided to, to leave the Republic and were some of their reasons justified? You know, they left because I know the um, the banking clan and all these other you know other groups, uh, the trade federation. Trade federation, you know, they, yeah, there you go. They left. They left initially because they thought that the tariffs that were in, instituted were unfair. Well, there were, I mean, were I feel like any business would would feel that way. <laughs> yeah. They they saw there was tariffs going on 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 different trading trade routes and it was squeezing their business and they saw it as unfair and a lot of the other separatists left because they saw how corrupt that the republic was getting and right, right. it was no longer working for in their minds no longer working for the common people but was only working to benefit the the senators and right. the different which was true yeah you know, by that point and that was even part of what you know palpatine supposedly was coming into power to try and change was to change that uh you know obviously he used it to his advantage and we know it's all a ruse but that was initially part of his plan when he came to power was to cur you know a more um, transparent government, a more, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to, and how many times have we heard that through history? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, oh, yes, um, my government will be more transparent, you know, and or his famous line of, I will lay down my power once this crisis is abated. Yeah, yeah, no, which you know, <laughs> I I don't know. It was, if you have a constant, if you have a constant crisis, then that never ends. Then you know he can just say, "Well, the crisis isn't over yet, so I can't lay down my power." Exactly, and by the end of it, it was too late anyway. Yeah, yeah. By the time anybody really realized what was happening, it was too it, late. Yes. And by that point, I think a lot of them didn't care. Yeah, I you mean, know? honestly, though, Palpatine, he he really did pull strings really well. And he kind of set all these other planets up to fail so that he could very easily yeah. swoop in, take over, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um and he set things up in such a way, and I know we talked about this, but you really can't talk about the Clone Wars without talking about the Senate himself. Um, 
in situations where, you know, I hear people say, well, what if Jar Jar didn't, you know, uh, put out the vote to give Palpatine emergency powers? Right. Set yeah. it up in a way that someone would have. If it wasn't for Jar Jar, if it wasn't Jar Jar, it would have been someone. Well, this is true, but you also have to yeah. remember that Jar Jar was also a Dark Lord of the Sith himself, so... Well, yes, it's true, yes. <laughs> Darth Jar Jar. Darth the Jar Jar. Yes, he... Yes, he was the... He was the... He was the... He was the Sith all along. <laughs> Who was the master? It was Palpatine was just a student. Exactly. <laughs> Misa am the real Senate. Yes. <laughs> But yeah, no, um, I really think that if he hadn't have done that, you're absolutely right. Uh, Palpatine would have found someone else to do it. Honestly, he probably could have tricked Amidala into doing it. Um, I think so, yeah. You know, at that, he, especially at that point, Amidala trusted Palpatine implicitly. I don't think it was until episode three in the timeline when you see her start to kind of question and you see that in the Clone Wars TV series where she slowly starts to kind of like think eh, is this really the best move we can do right um, and see and she kind of noticed that she that you know that Palp the Chancellor at that time the Chancellor was gaining more and more power um, mm -hmm. and you know even you know the Jedi were starting to notice it too and you know everyone else, but yeah, at that point, in episode, by, you know, whenever he was granted emergency powers, you know, everyone just thought, you know, it was well, one they thought it was the only way. You know, right. a war, yeah. a war was headed their way, and they didn't have enough manpower with just a Jedi to, you know, main to basically conduct a major war like that. So right. Yeah, no, right. and then that goes back to what I was talking about with, you know, a lot of these planets only having such a a limited military force that they had yeah. to they had to go to the Jedi and the Jedi who they were as protectors, I think just kind of took up that mantle of protector. I don't think they ever meant to become generals, but it was a role that needed to be filled. And yeah. through their training, they were honestly as as ill suited as they were. They were still better suited the than somebody else from a random yeah, backwater were, planet. Were, you know, the, the natural candidates to take up that leadership role in the military, like that. Right. And honestly, as as a military member, I can you know kind of see into that kind of world a little bit. So. When when you're looking at, at somebody who's such a high profile leader, number one, somebody that you know and that you can trust, such as a Jedi, would mm -hmm. be somebody that you would follow. You yeah. Know? And so I think that by putting the Jedi in that position, I, I do kind of think that Palpatine knew what he was doing when he did that. Because that was very that made it very easy for any mistake that the Jedi made to get turned to where now they're looking like the bad guys. And it was very easy, and you can see that turn, especially if you watch the Clone Wars, the, T the Clone Wars TV series, you can see that turn where the Jedi, you know, were, you know, the, um, the, the outside view of the Jedi was not always necessarily a very positive one. Exactly. You yeah. know, in many times, in many times, the Jedi were blamed for the war. Yeah, yeah, they and they really was, did. They the, got you know, that it was a lot. The Jedi, it was the Jedi. This war was the was it was the Jedi. It was the Jedi war, and right, a uh, lot of a lot of places. Um, I can't remember if they ever actually said it, but I really do feel like they did. Um, so, if anybody out there actually uh, knows a specific instance that they said this, but it, it, they felt that it was um, basically not their war. It was the Jedi's war. They 
Yeah. It was them, and whenever a Jedi came, they brought trouble with them. Yeah, yeah, and you get that, yeah, you get that a lot, you know, in even, even in the old legends, you got that a lot where, you know, the stories of wherever the Jedi went, trouble came. And if a Jedi came there, yeah, you were kind of like, you know, again, crossing streams if you're a Doctor Who fan, wherever the Doctor goes, trouble follows. The same <laughs> right. thing with the... The same thing with the Jedi, where the Jedi went, trouble followed, especially during the Clone Wars. You know, if if you if a Jedi was there, you could be pretty sure that a Separatist fleet would be wouldn't be in battle droids wouldn't be far behind. Right, but also a lot of times because we see it, we're watching the TV or the movie or the show or whatever, we're or reading the book. We're privy to information that the characters within the book are or show are not necessarily privy to. So, yeah. to all right, I'm, I'm going to throw out a hypothetical here. You got this little farming village on some planet that the Empire wants the planet for whatever resource, or just yeah. like plasteel or something. We'll throw that out there. So, um, you know, they get. Uh, they get the uh, Jedi to show up to protect the people because the Empire showed up, but yeah. then the people don't know that. The people don't know that the Empire is there. And then yeah. all of a sudden, it's it's chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Well... One of the things, and I, it was, it's something that I, I really liked that they talk about in episode three, is they, in the opening crawl, they mentioned that there are, um, I think the line is there were heroes on both sides. Right. And I think that's one thing I definitely liked that the Clone Wars did was that they showed that, you know, in a few episodes that there were people that fought heroically and sacrifice themselves for what they believed in on the side of the separatists which leads me to the big question is it's easy to look at especially in the original star wars movies um episode four five and six and even even the even the sequels of it being very black and white empire bad rebels good so so yeah um i mean as we were saying it was very black and white in the original trilogy and even the sequels, whereas in the prequel trilogies, I don't think it was quite as black and white. You know, it's not necessarily a situation where it was Republic good, Separatist bad. Um, yes, there were elements. I think there are more elements in the Separatists that you can look at and saying these are definitely bad guys. You know, right. Dooku, I think you can pretty much say, you know, was a bad guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grievous was a bad guy. But I don't think that, you know, you can say that about the Separatists as a whole or the Republic as a whole, that the Republic was wholly good. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they did things that were, both sides did things that were, you know, I mean, could be considered war crimes. Right. I think we noticed it more with the Jedi, though, because they were supposed to be held to a different standard. Different standard, yeah, yeah, and not that know. not that we knew a whole lot about the Separatists, but you know, they we we knew that they were businessmen, traders, bankers, things of that nature. And, you know, I think um, Palpatine well, we... really preyed on that, kind of like he preyed on yeah. the fears of the senate and turned them that's but how there was more i mean that's one thing the clone wars tv series go went into was it was more than just you know the bankers and the trade unions and groups like that that separated there were actual planets there were actual you know it wasn't just the business side you know the businessmen and these you know corporations that wanted to separate from the republic there were you know actual planets and actual star systems that were 
said, you know, we're, no, we're tired of the bureaucracy. We're tired of, you know, feeling like we don't have a voice in the, in the Senate that decided to separate. So, yeah, it was a lot more nuanced than. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. In the prequels, it definitely was more, there was a lot more gray area. And with the yeah. whole explanation following Anakin Skywalker, they they really kind of emphasized that fact that he, that it wasn't black and white. He was doing what he thought was right, which to yeah. him may not necessarily, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff he did, sure, that was very very plainly evil but yeah but, but was it really you can kind of relate you know he the the sand people had uh had killed his mother in his eyes so yeah. the natural course would be to get revenge now yeah. yes that's against the jedi tenants but as a human being is it yeah no oh no definitely not but and i think I think that was one of the problems with the Clone Wars, with why it kind of led to the, the eventual fall of the Jedi, was it put the Jedi in situ in a lot of situations where they're it it put them in more temptation to go to the dark side. Oh yeah, because because of. You know the different situations we were, and we you know, we saw that with other with you know different Jedi that did fall, not just you know Anakin, but there were uh, there were others that did fall or did at least stray close to that dark ed- that dark side edge because of situations they would be put in as you know um, you know generals and soldiers and being in in combat like that now I think one thing that George that Lucas did to kind of negate that as far as when he created the you know created the Clone Wars and came up with the concepts and everything like that was having them fight against machines yeah you know the fact that the fact that they're fighting against droids they they can almost take the moral you know quote unquote moral high ground because they're slaughtering all these soldiers but they're not really soldiers they're just machines yeah they're just droids but then again hey droid life droid lives matter okay right <laughs> but one of the one of the things that um I want to say I read it somewhere uh, the reason that they went with the stormtroopers the way they were was so that you didn't feel like it was, you know, them shooting another human being. This was just some a clone, like somebody in a suit. You, or yeah. it gives you that. Imp- it kind of creates that disconnect that it's not really a person. But yeah. then you got the the. Um, uh, what was that episode seven we see uh finn you know he's got the blood on his helmet and he takes it off and for the first time you see it's a it's a stormtrooper so, well quote unquote stormtrooper but it is a human it is a person person yeah yeah which we did we got that, that in the clone wars but it, again it, it was a cgi and everything so it, and it was always the same person but yeah but we didn't get that in the um, the the original trilogy, you know, the stormtroopers were always just that; they were just faceless men in mask. Right, exactly, exactly. That, you know, didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of lines or yeah, and they than, they weren't um, <laughs> they weren't relatable. You know, they're yeah. just a guy in a suit being an extra, doing what extras do. Um, yeah. But and you know this this is kind of a uh, uh, possibly a point of contention. I might have people you know saying, "Oh, jeez, are you kidding me?" I heard a lot of people didn't really care for the way that Bodega portrayed Finn and all of that. But for me, when I first watched uh, episode seven and he he pulled off that helmet and he had that that look of panic that you know. 
what is happening right now kind of thing going on. It makes you feel kind of bad for all the stormtroopers. Yeah. Yeah. How many well, of them go through that, you know? Well, and I mean, even throughout history, I mean, how many, how many soldiers the first time they were in combat experienced that? Yeah. And went through that panic of, you know, I think of, you know, watching a movie like uh, Saving Private Ryan. Yep. And yep. storming, you know, storming the beaches of Normandy and seeing, you know, that for the first, you know, your buddies killed in front of you for the first time, people that you would. And with him, you know, these were people literally from birth that he had grown up with because right. they were taken as children to be raised to be stormtroopers. And these are people that he had literally grown up with all his life. And now he's suddenly seeing their, you know, their blood for the first time. And yeah, I mean, war can be, you know, can do things to a guy. And Mm -hmm. yeah, especially when you don't have, you know, unlike the clone troopers who had that, you know, stuff bred naturally bred into them. Yeah. So that they were, they were completely. It was completely different because the clones were bred not to show fear, not to show, and even they did. You know, there were times when they, they, they did show fear, and but you know they were bred to overcome that. Whereas someone like Finn, who was just a guy, <laughs> right? For all, if, yeah. For all intents and purposes, he's just a guy. Um. You know, yes, a highly trained guy, but not, probably not to the the extent that the clones would have been. Right. Well, the, I mean, the clones themselves were clones of Django, which, yes, was a created character, but still, he was known to be a very good bounty hunter. He was good at what yeah. he did. He had nerves of steel, uh, you know, reportedly, things like that. And so being cut from the same cloth, it it just lended itself to them being the perfect soldier. Yeah. And, and then able, you know, um, to, you know, to be independent and think for themselves, but at the same time, follow orders almost religiously. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, you if you were given an order, that was that was it. And that was, you know basically bred into them yeah you know, he... genetically genetically you know their genetic makeup was such that you know they almost had to obey right well uh, the commands that were given them my question is what exactly was the point of a stormtrooper's armor because it did it did not stop it anything did. from killing them well <laughs> well I actually read this, and they talked about the difference between the stormtrooper armor and the um, the clone armor, mm -hmm. and how they were they were different in what they what they did. And one, and I can't remember which one it was, but one was designed to basically, I think it was the clone armor, to when they were hit, that it would. Um, take the blast and absorb it throughout the entire body. So it would it would basically take it and instead of just being at one point, the blast you know hitting one point and all the power and energy be at that point, it would take it and then dissipate it over the entire body so that the effect wouldn't be as hmm. as strong. And then the other one did basically something almost the opposite. Oh. It, it almost like tried to deflect it off, and I think it was the. I think it was the stormtroopers uh, absorbed it, so when you would see them get shot, they nece necessarily die. They would get knocked out and be in a lot of pain, but the blast wouldn't necessarily kill them. Whereas with the clones, when they were shot, they were more likely to have been killed. <laughs> right because of how well, the, of how, how the how the armor worked but for the most part the armor for both the stormtroopers and the uh 
uh, clone troopers was intimidation. Oh, you know, well. it was it was you know you see you know you're you know you're a rebel soldier and you see a bunch of you know highly trained highly disciplined sol- you know soldiers coming at you in shining white you know bright white armor you know that's going to be a pretty intimidating sight right and i imagine that was quite into i mean the helmet itself looked pretty intimidating honestly yeah and it also acted as like their own you know heads up display they're able to get all kinds of information you know both the clones and stormtroopers are able to get so much you know in from battle information of what was going on in real time with that helmet yeah you know they're able to communicate with you know hq and figure out what was going on minute by minute second by second so they right. were up to date you know, everything going on around them whereas like the rebels were you know more in the dark than than they were and the same thing with the now with the with the droids you know with with technology you know they probably were a little bit more technologically equal to the clones as far as what they were able to do what they were able to maintain and as far as that kind of um being able to communicate with communications and stuff like that but yeah and they could pretty much communicate instantaneously yeah yeah especially the droids they were able to you know just roger roger yeah the roger roger and that was that boop <laughs> roger roger boop. um yeah, I, and that's one thing i loved in in the clone wars was giving the the droid um the battle droids, the your typical battle droids, those personalities. Yeah, those were the. I laughed so many times when the droids were on that sort <laughs> of pessimistic. We're all gonna die. Nothing is worth it. Yeah, <laughs> what are we here? Attitude. I, I really enjoyed them in the Clone Wars that way because they they almost had their own personalities. They did, but. It was hilarious you know just oh well, here we go again yeah type of, type of attitude that was just so funny yeah and, I quite enjoy it. the only thing I wish is that um, in uh, primarily episode 4 um, I, I feel like anytime they were on Tatooine really or uh, a planet like that I wish they had of maybe slipped in one of those droids in the background, you know, on the, the yeah. Jawa's trade bar or junk barge or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Like that would have been, been awesome. That would have been, that would have been something that would have been like, if they ever do a, you know, cause I know even when they did the, um, the remaster, the, um, the special edition, uh, release of a new hope and everything like that, that was done before the prequels were done, but still, if they ever to redo, the original trilogy or right. remaster again and add new things to have a battle droid you know the old b1 battle droid in the background of the jawa uh sand crawler would be hilarious just oh yeah or seeing um seeing a what they call them um the trade for uh gun ray called them uh droidicas no oh, droidicas yeah the, the battle the uh the um um, um Oh, what were they? Droidy cuz I had another name for them. Yeah. Destroyers. Destroyer, Destroyers. yeah. Just seeing Destroyers. one of them just kind of sitting in the background, kind of rusted. Oh. You know, yeah. that that would be that'd be pretty cool to see. Yeah. Um you know, we can we can talk about this a little bit is what the uh the separatist is. I mean, what if you were to give a explanation for who best fits the description what group best fits the description of the separatists would it be would you look at the confederates and the civil war hmm uh, that that's an uh, interesting question 
I mean, would they? I mean, can you look at that Clone Wars as being, um, you know, very close to the the American Civil War, where you have a group that would, you know, quote unquote, fighting for their rights against a a group that was wanting to maintain a union. See, that's what I think I would relate it more to, because yeah. that's essentially what they were trying to do uh, granted it was all manipulation but that's what they were trying yeah. to do is yeah. they they just wanted to conduct their business the way yeah. they wanted to conduct it but they, they had all these doing, others right? yeah in the republic you know the the they, the the galactic republic was fighting much like you know the the united states was during the civil war to maintain the union and keep the union united and right um, exactly yeah i i think that that's um exactly what it boils down to is uh i think that was the imagery that they were going for um and and it it again it creates that that gray area where you're sitting here watching it and you you say well they're not really bad guys no yeah no they're not they're not and i don't think that when you look at the overall scope of what the the separatists were fighting for which was basically the right to be independent the mm -hmm. right to make their own decisions and to govern themselves as you said as they see fit whether this be the trade federation or you know, whatever individual planet planet decided to separate from the Republic, that they were fighting for what they saw as their rights against what they saw was a corrupt government. And on the same token, you can look at the Republic, and they're saying, we're fighting to maintain law and order. We're maintaining to keep this this system that has been in place for at that point thousands of years intact you know to keep this union you know basically saying we're stronger together than we are apart yeah and um so they're you know they're fighting you know for a completely different and i think that's one thing and i think that got lost in the muddle much like if you look at through a history of the first world war where the causes of war and the reason why they were fighting got so muddled it just came down to you know battle droids bad clones good or vice versa whatever side you were on and the reasoning behind the war i think especially for people in the republic people you know the, the everyday people that were there i think they got to the point that they're like what's the point of this war and like we said at the beginning, that's where the blaming the Jedi came in. Yep. Where yeah. it looked like a war that was never going to end. It looked like a war where even if there were peace overtures given, they were shot down. And people started wondering, like, why, you know, why, why don't we negotiate? Why don't we, you know, figure a way to end this war? And of course, it was, again, it was all manipulation by Palpatine. Um, which of course leads us to the end of the war, yeah, and how quickly it ended. Well, and, and, pretty pretty easy to end a war when you can just initiate an order and it completely wipes out one side. Yeah, yeah, the Jedi. Well, and then you know Anakin going into basically where the entire Separatist Council was. And slaughtering basically every major leader of the other side. Yeah. And, you know, without the leadership, yeah, you have the droids, but, you know, it's easy to just, and, you know, give the order to deactivate the droids, and then yeah. you have Order 66, and the Jedi are done, and then. Then that's, that's it. it. Yeah. The war's that's over, it. and. The war's over, and everybody's everybody's happy you know the empire has risen has come into power and you know well you know we need a strong central government so i guess that's 
Yeah, I mean, Palpatine t- turned around and said, look, you know, we're in a state of needing to rebuild and I can help do that. Just leave me in power a little bit longer and the next thing they know Harry's, you know that was giving it. his giving his famous speech of uh the Republic being reorganized as the Galactic Empire and democracy ends in cheers. Exactly. That was all it took. And we we made well you made mention of it in the last show that it's, it was that kind of situation where everything had to go just right. And, yeah. man, you know, he pulled that off. What a well, schemer. I think, and I think I think there's a lot of other... Because when he made that speech of... Uh, at the end of episode three, where he, you know, says, you know, yeah, I've reorganized the... the the Republic into the new, into the first ever Galactic Empire. He had to have known, you know, read the people, read, you know, to know that what the response would have been when he made that. Mm-hmm. That they would cheer and they would say, yeah, because he set everything up so much and he knew, he knew people and he knew how they would respond. Right, and, and he really did put everybody in a spot where they they would revere him. I mean, he essentially he was the one that ended the war, whether yeah. or not they knew the real way that it ended. It was the fact that somehow, and he probably put a, a spin on it in some way that made him look like the hero. And oh yeah, well. Well, I mean, him him goes coming in and saying that he just survived an assassination attempt, and you already had, you know, the Jedi started to be painted in a negative light. Exactly. So From the war, yeah. When he comes in and said, when he comes in and said they tried to assassinate me, then that makes it easier for him to explain Order sixty six, and the reason for that, like, well, you know, these people have special abilities. So we can't just arrest them. Yeah, the only which... option is for us to to kill them. You know, to you know to, to to kill them. And well, with the children, you can explain that of like, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but unfortunately, you know, these children would grow up to become these superhuman powered people. So, you know, unfortunately, we have to, you know. And that that kind of makes me think, though, um, kind of a, kind of off tangent a little bit, but not mm-hmm. too. It goes off of what you were just saying. So as as we know throughout the the history of the Jedi and and whatnot, uh, children are born with force sensitive capabilities. They often are sent, either sent or the Jedi go out and collect them to be trained as Jedi. So what what would stop the force is going to be born within more children so did palpatine have some way of knowing when a force sensitive child was born and just got rid of it or well well i know during rebels they bring in the um uh the inquisition right and their job was basically to do that, was to go out and these were people that had been either, many of them were former Jedi who had turned to the dark side or were force sensitive you know, people uh, that um, for whatever reason had survived Order 66 and had turned and they weren't turned into full Sith but their job was to go and seek out um Jedi that had survived Order 60, that had, you know, survived Order 66, or to seek out, you know, Force-sensitive children, and then make the decision, you know, then the Emperor or Vader would make the decision whether or not to bring them in and train them as Inquisitors, or to kill them. Ah, okay, see, there you go. So that's basically what the, what the the Inquisitors were those, was that, because obviously, as powerful as Vader was, he couldn't track down every single Jedi 
that had survived the order. Mm -hmm. Um, So they would send out the Inquisitors to hunt them down and to kill them or try and turn them. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, So, um, you know, we're we're starting to to get kind of close to time here. So I want to ask you another uh, hypothetical question like I did last time. And just kind of get your uh, theory, if you will, or your spin on it. So my question to you this episode is, what do you think would have been the outcome had the Jedi found the clone army and said, Mm -hmm. nope, we need to put an end to this and we're not using them? That's a good question. I think as manipulative and as thinking, having a plan within a plan within a plan within a plan, I think Palpatine had a contingency plan think for so, huh? that. Okay. I, I'm, I think that's the way Palpatine's mind worked, was he had not only plan A, B, and C, but he had all the way down to plan quadruple A. <laughs> I, mean, had, I don't doubt that. I really he don't. Had so many conten- he had so many contingency <laughs> plans that the only way that those plans would not have worked and he would not have risen to power or was is if he was found out immediately and killed or imprisoned immediately. Okay. I could buy I it. Think that's I guess I could buy a- that. I think that's really the only way that you don't have some sort of rise of Palpatine into some sort of coming to power in some way, shape, or form, whatever form that takes. I think that he had planned things out so meticulously that, you know, the only way he doesn't come to power is if he is found out immediately. I gotcha. Okay. So, all right. So you you think that even if they did do away with the the clone army, dispersed them all out to do whatever and live the rest of their lives, you think that he would have come up with some other way to initiate the war anyway? Yeah, he would have manipulated a situation that a either without the Jedi Jedi's blessing that the clones still come, you know. Are, you know, he basically could have said, as Chancellor, he could have said, you know, well, the Jedi don't make decisions on policy. You know, you're you're not policymaker, so it's not your decision whether or not we use the clones or not. And no, just said, well, okay. know, just brought the clones brought the clones in anyway. I think that's the most likely scenario is if the Jedi would have said, no, we're not going to, we don't want to use them. That he would have said, well, you don't make policy decisions. This is a this is a decision for the you know the Senate and the Chancellor to to make and the Jedi don't aren't involved in that so yeah you know, I could you know, I could have, buy that yeah you don't have a choice you can either be a part of this or you can get out of the way and just and that might even even you know and it helped him initiate Order sixty six sooner because if the Jedi were opposed to it and started, you know, to physically oppose it, he could have said, Hey, I'm trying to protect, you know, the Republic here by using these, you know, these, these soldiers, but these people that are supposed to be guardians of guardians of, of peace and justice in the Republic are standing against it, you know, a way to protect the people of the Republic. So are they really Republic, you know, um, are they really protecting you? And he could have made the excuse to even institute Order 66 a lot sooner. Oh, yeah, that's very true. He could so, he could have done that. You know, there's, there's so many, you know, different things. But again, like I said, I think that he would have tried to find a way. He would have figured out something. I think, you know, that's one thing about Palpatine was he's a survivor and he is very intelligent. I will definitely give you that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he made it through six movies, so... <laughs> that's true. That's true. 
Yeah, um, you know that. I I just he's such a, a predominant figure throughout all those movies, and you kind of watch. It almost seems like he becomes more evil as it goes along, too. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. he just. And I think it'll be really interesting to, um, to get a book now in the new canon. I know there are some stories and some books about um, Palpatine's rise and his early life and how he how he how he became a Sith mm-hmm. in well, legends. But I think it would really be interesting to see in the new canon his story of how he how he came to how he felt, you know did he you know how he fell to the dark side um, how he became a, a dark lord of the Sith and how he fell into the tutelage of um, Plagueis. Yeah, which and, would be amazing to get some more info on that. The, you know, which um, this is something now, I don't know if this is still canon, but in the original Legends, Plagueis was still alive at the beginning of episode two. Oh, Huh. And the original story, and there's a story, uh, one of the story about 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 Plagueis. He was finally, um, Palpatine was finally able to kill him. Uh, all it was, it was basically shortly after the scene in the opera house. Hmm. And, you know, three, I could see that. I out, really could. He goes back and he kills. He gets him so in the story he goes. He got he got Plagueis so drunk that he wasn't able to basically stand and then he electrocuted him used force lightning to kill him while he was basically blackout drunk huh nice uh, yeah what a way so to go how, <laughs> that, uh, yeah yeah but anyway we will we'll wrap things up here right now and hope you enjoyed this little look back of the clone wars and uh, join us next week as we uh, switch gears a little bit and go back to our character, one of our character profiles, as we look at the chosen one, Anakin <laughs> Skywalker. Oh yes, slash Darth Vader. The look at, as I said, the chosen one. Uh, until then, uh, remember you can find us on every, pretty much every major uh, podcast platform, including Apple i. Apple iP ah, Apple Podcast, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, of course, always on Anchor.fm, which is your one-stop shop for any podcast you want to hear on Realm of the Mist. Um, you can also check us out on YouTube. Remember to leave a comment. Uh, remember to check out the Patreon page, and if you're not really into Patreon. Again, at anchor.fm, there's a little button down there near the bottom that says support. You can give us monetary support then. We really appreciate it, and it really helps us put out the best quality um, podcast that we possibly can. Because that's what we want to give you with any of our shows is the best quality podcast, uh, entertainment podcast on the internet. Um, that's our goal. You can find me on Twitter at John Mark Tolly one because I'm of course the number one John Mark Tolly on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook at Mark Tolly. Uh, I remember to check out the Facebook page not only for Realm of the Mist, uh, but War of the Stars. And remember to buy the T-shirt. We have a we have a War of the Stars T-shirt. You can go on to the. Uh, Realm of the Mist website to search Realm of the Mist on Google and it will probably pop up there and you can get all the information they are made to order uh, so just give us your size and we will try and we will get that out to you as soon as possible uh, Ray where can they find you at uh, you guys can find me on uh, Chronicles of the Lost Realm that's found on Facebook and on Instagram under the same name. Just type that into the search bar and you'll be up and running. That's right. Uh, same, you can also find uh, 
Realm of the Mist on Instagram too at Realm of the Mist Entertainment and Twitter at Realm of the Mist Entertainment. And I think that's about it. So uh, until next time, remember, the Force will be with you always. <laughs>